I never know when the music's going to end. It is great to be able to preach live to you. If you guys are like me, we watch the video, the broadcast every week, and I love Dave and Kyle. Um, but there's something inside of me that just wants to preach every once in a while. Today is one of those days. So for those in the back, I am not a hologram. I am live, okay? I'm in person. So I am so glad that you're here. We're in the middle of a series called People Matter. And today we're going to talk about, our theme is called The Heart of the Matter. And so all week as I was preparing for this, God has kind of been doing this little uh, work in my heart in this tug of war because uh, I know that he challenges us in John chapter 13. He says, this new command I give to you that you will love one another. In fact, he says, people will know that we are his followers by the way that we love other people. And so in my mind this week, I started taking inventory of people that I have a hard time loving. Okay, and and I'm not just talking about the guy who's driving under the speed limit in the fast lane. Okay, all right. Although there's there's a little bit of that. I'm not just talking about the person who in the grocery line decides that today's the day they're going to write a check. Okay, to pay for their groceries. That's what I'm talking. I'm talking about people in our lives that God puts there who really are hard to love. Uh, people who hurt us, or worse yet, maybe hurt somebody that we love. People that maybe have lied to us, that have said, I- I'll do better, I promise, I promise, I promise, and they don't. Or people who took something from us. Or people who, who just keep making poor choice after poor choice after poor choice. Or maybe people who are so different than us, we just go, I, I don't know if I can really... I don't know if I can really understand and really relate to that. The truth is, is that there's not one person alive that God doesn't love. Every single man God looks at as one of his sons. Every single woman that's alive, God looks at as one of his daughters. Every single person that you're going to see today, God loves. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, am I okay that God loves people that I don't love? That's a pretty heavy question, isn't it? Um, That's a pretty heavy question. Probably as I was doing my introduction here, you came up with a name or a face. Let's be honest, you probably got a top three, right? Right? People that you're like, "Mm, mm, mm, mm." God loves them, period. (laughs) <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I, I, it, that's a hard thing. And so today we're going to take a look at a story from the Bible of a man who God sent to talk to some people that he didn't like, and his name was Jonah. Now, as soon as I mention that, we're going to be studying the book of Jonah today. Here's what happens. There's two different kinds of people in this room. The first one are those of you that raised knowing the story of Jonah, and you're like, oh, Jonah, an oldie but a goodie. I wonder what seed we're going to be in today when they bring out the, uh, the uh, bracketology this afternoon at 6 o'clock. You know, you think we'll be a, a 6, 7, we'll be a 1, 2. What do you think will happen? Do the tournaments really matter? You know, or they go on the whole body of work? Because you're familiar with Jonah, and all of a sudden you go, well, I'm going to mail it in for the next 22 minutes. Did you see what I did there? For the next 22 minutes, I'm going to be able to just mail it in. And, and, and I want to encourage you not to do that. But I also know that there are people here who go, are you kidding me? A man swallowed by a great fish? That could never happen. And I would encourage you to listen because of two things. The first thing is, is in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus himself quotes the story of Jonah. So if Jesus believes it, then I think we should believe it. But maybe you're like, hey, I'm not really down with Jesus yet. Well, do you believe the news? Because one week ago, I was given a gift. There was a man by the name of Rainer Shrimp whose job was to, he's a dive tour operator. And so he would take groups of people out to be with, to whale watch and to swim next to them. And he actually got swallowed by a whale. You can see his rear end right there. All right? So if you don't believe Jesus, at least believe NBC News, okay? Because we have photo evidence that a man was swallowed by a whale, and he lived to tell about it. In fact, this is what he said. He said, it was an interesting experience for me, but surely nothing I want to do again. Probably an understatement. So today we're going to be taking a look at the book of Jonah. I want to ask you to turn your Bibles or open up your Bible app to the book of Jonah. If you don't have either one of those in the seat rack in front of you, there's a Bible. You can go there. It's in the Old Testament, almost to the end of the Old Testament in an area that we call 
the minor prophets, and we're going to work our way through the book of Jonah. Now, Jonah, let me give you some background before we jump into this. Jonah is only mentioned a couple times in the Bible. I've already talked about when Jesus mentioned him, but all the way back in the book of Amos, he came, he was called by a king called Jeroboam II. Now, Jeroboam II was a horrible, awful, brutal dictator of the children of Israel. He did not follow God, but yet he, all, he treated God like a, a, a good luck charm or a lucky rabbit's foot. And so before we go into battle, he would call in the prophet and he'd say, hey, what are the chances of victory today? And so he calls in Jonah, God's prophet, God's man, and he says, hey, Jonah, what's the, what's the chances of winning today? And Jonah says, Jeroboam, you got it made. No problem, you're going to win this. Well, shortly after that, the older, more wise prophet of God, Amos, comes in. And he goes, Jeroboam, I, I don't know where Jonah got his information, but God's revealed to me that today, not only will you lose, it will be a devastating loss. And so we already can see that Jonah's character is a little bit suspicious, even before we dive in to the story of Jonah. And so let's jump in. Jonah chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now here's what we know about the city of Nineveh. It was a big city. We're going to learn about it later on. But it was an important city, but it also was a very wicked city. And God calls Jonah. Jonah to go and preach to them the truth. And in verse, the next verse, verse 3, it says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee for the Lord. Now, we don't know why, but for some reason, Jonah hated the people of of Nineveh. We don't know what they'd ever done to him. Had they hurt somebody in his family? Maybe they had this reputation of being this cruel people he wanted nothing to do with. Maybe he thought, man, they are so different. They believe and they live so different. Just let God deal with them in the end. But for whatever reason, Jonah did not want to do. And so he went in, he went the opposite direction. Now for us sitting here today, it's kind of hard to understand Joppa, Tarshish, Nineveh. What's that look like? So I've got a map for us to look at right here. This is where Jonah was. And God said, I want you to go up to Nineveh. And it was about 550 miles from Joppa up to Nineveh. It would take him a little bit of time. Jonah literally goes down to port and he says, I need the ticket the farthest away that you can get. And he bought a ticket to Tarshish, which is 2,500 miles away. Not only is it that far away, it literally was the western edge of the known world. So you get with the picture? God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And he says, how far away can I get? Like, take me to the edge of the map. And so he gets on a boat and he goes. And in, in chapter one, we read and see what happens. It says that the Lord sent a great wind and there was a violent storm and the ship began to be torn apart by the storm. Now, these veteran sailors, they had been through storms before, but they knew that something was different. And so they do everything they can to save the ship. And then they, they notice that their passenger wasn't around. And so they go down, they find Jonah asleep in the bottom of the ship. And they wake him up and they say, hey, we're going to die. We got to get this together. And they're trying to figure it out. And the storm gets worse and worse and worse. And they actually says that they cast lots. So I don't know if they did rock, paper, scissors or what they did, but it fell to Jonah. He's like, hey guys, I got to tell you something. I'm sort of running from God Almighty. And uh, you know, this is not a good thing. So Jonah's solution is if you want to live, here's what you got to do. You got to throw me overboard into the sea. Now these sailors were scared to death, but they weren't stupid. They knew the difference between suicide and homicide, okay? And they said, it's one thing for you to jump, it's another thing for us to throw you. So we're going to do everything we can. So they started to lighten the load of the boat, but it says, it says in chapter one, the storm kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, Jonah says, you're going to pick me up and throw me into the sea. And we see something amazing happen. Because these sailors who at the beginning said, hey guys, this is really bad. You need to pray or do or chant or dance or whatever you do to worship to see if we can get some good luck here. They turn a corner and it says that they began to talk to God. And they said, God, and it's capital L, Lord, do not hold us accountable for what's about to happen. And so they threw Jonah into the sea. Do you get the irony here? God's prophet, God's man, Jonah, runs from God, disobeys God, puts other people's lives in jeopardy, and these secular, hardened sailors go from worshiping whatever God they have to worshiping the one true God. 
It's amazing. And it only tells us the, the severity of the storm. But we keep walking through because as soon as, as soon as Jonah hit the water, the sea grew calm. In the end, in verse 16, it says, And at this the men greatly feared the Lord and offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. They were quick converts, weren't they? And I love, I love what the Bible says. And so Jonah, his out, his way of running from God, rather than turn around and do what he want, was just to take his own life. And so as he sinks down through this sea, all of a sudden it says in verse 17, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Don't you love the Bible? It's, it's subtle. It's understated, right? I mean, can you imagine being inside of a fish for three days and three nights, 72 hours? It would have to be an assault on all of your senses. I mean, you think about it. What would it feel like to be inside of a fish? Was it this giant cavern or was the stomach closed around you? Was it warm? Was it cold as the, fish, as the great fish kept eating and more water came in and, and junk? I mean, it had to feel gross. I would imagine after three days you would get a little hungry, but I mean, you're kind of looking around. If you could look, I don't know if it was light or not, you know, and you're looking at the stuff that a fish eats inside and that's... Uh, Maybe I'll fast, okay? You know, I mean, you, you, so, so you've got the feel, you've got the hunger. What do you hear inside of a great fish? I mean, what does it sound like? And, and, and I was always intrigued by this, and you know what? The Bible doesn't tell us, so whatever you're imagining, that's good, all right? It's good for you. But he was in there for three days and three nights, and then I love what happens as we turn the corner into chapter 2, because this is what it says in chapter 2, verse 1. From inside the fish... Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. You know, I think there is times in our lives when we have run from God, and we find ourselves at a worse place, and then all of a sudden, we think it can't get any worse, and it does. And then a lot of times at those moments is when we turn and we pray to God. God, I thought I was in a bad place. Little did I know I'm in a worse place now, and I need your help. And so Jonah prays from inside the fish. And all of chapter 2 is Jonah's prayer of reaching out to God. And the last verse, is verse 10 of chapter 2, says, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. i got to wonder about that moment. Okay? Just, this is just like a little timeout. This is just inside the crazy brain of Michael. Okay? So you get vomited by a fish. So on the one hand, you're outside. So you're like, yay. But on the other hand, you're fish vomit, right? Anybody else? Or is it just me? Okay, all right. Well, we'll move on, okay? That's not what I want to talk about. But the, the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. And then chapter 3 starts with this. It says, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message that I give you. And I love what the Bible says in verse 3 of chapter 3. Jonah obeyed. Like, okay, you've beaten me into submission, all right? I give. Uncle, I'm going to go. And he went to Nineveh. And it says Nineveh was a very important city. It says that it required a three-day visit. Now, we don't know if it took three days to walk around the circumference of the city or if there were so many things to see inside the city of Nineveh that it would take you a three-day vacation to be able um, to see it. But verse 4 says, On the first day, Jonah started into the city, and he proclaimed, Forty more days, and Nineveh will will be overturned. Now, I got to be honest with you. If I had just survived this, this fish experience, when I got to Nineveh, I think my sermon would be a little more than eight words. Like, I think Jonah's mailing it in here. Do you know what I mean? 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's his whole thing. How will it be overturned? When will it be overturned? Why will it be overturned? Jonah doesn't give anything. He walks up and he gives the bare minimum. And he thinks, because these are people he doesn't like, and he probably believes because these are people he doesn't really care about, and he hopes God will just sort it out, that they'll go, what? What are you talking about? In fact, the exact opposite happens. Because the Ninevites in chapter, verse 5, it says, The Ninevites believed God, and they declared a fast, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Jonah's worst nightmare is coming true. 
These people now were aware that God was angry at them for what their life was like, and they repented. They turned around. And even in verse 6, we read that it got to the ears of the king, and the king declared a national day of worship and of repentance. And he proclaimed to everybody in Nineveh that nobody could work. They all had to worship God. And in verse 10 of chapter 3, it says this, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring on them the destruction that they had threatened. Oh, What a great story. What a great ending to the story. Isn't it great? God used a reluctant prophet to save an entire city. The problem is, that's not the end of the story, is there? There is another chapter, chapter 4, and it says that Jonah was greatly displeased and got angry. Wait, what? You're sent by God to preach to people that they're going to be destroyed unless they repent and turn to God. You preach the shortest sermon in all the Old Testament, and the entire city, from the king to the the highest to the lowest, repents and turns to God, and you are angry and displeased. And in fact, in verse 2, Jonah basically says, I knew it! I knew it! I knew you'd give in! You do it every time, God! These people don't deserve to be saved! These people don't deserve to be forgiven! They deserve to die because of what they've done! They deserve to die because of what, who they are! And you forgave them! I knew it! Sounds funny today, doesn't it? You know when it's not funny? Is when we're standing in our living room. And we hear that somebody who's hurt us has given their life to God. When we hear that our ex-wife or our ex-husband that just did us wrong is going to church. And we're okay with them because we didn't run from God. We just kind of distance ourselves from them. And we hear that God loves them. The person that hurt our child I mean, come on, God. Where's the justice in that? And God comes pretty strong at Jonah. Chapter 4, verse 4. That's what God says. Do you have any right to be angry? For the first time in Jonah's story, he shows a little bit of wisdom. He does not answer. Like, that's a good thing. Jonah, the best thing you can say here is absolutely nothing. Instead, he takes his ball and his pack, and he walks up on a hill, and he sits on a hill, and he goes, I'm going to watch, because I know these Ninevites, they cannot keep a promise. They're going to turn, and they're going to burn, and I'm going to be right here, front row, to see the whole thing. It's going to be awesome. And he goes up there, and God causes a vine to grow up over Jonah to shade his head and ease his discomfort, because apparently it was hot. And the next morning, God provides a worm that comes and eats and chews the vine so it withers. And then God provided a scorching east wind, and it blazed on Jonah's head. And once again, Jonah goes to his go-to thing. Oh, it'd be better for me to die than to live here. I don't know if Jonah was that dramatic, if he was manic, if he was off his meds. I don't know what was going on, but every time he faced something, he was like, it's better for me to die. I just need to die. It'd be better for me to get to die. And in verse 9, God says to Jonah a second time, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? And Jonah says, I do. I'm angry enough to die. God doesn't even respond to that. And here's what he says in conclusion in verse 10. You can be concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Do you see what God is doing? He's connecting some dots. He said, Jonah, you are so concerned with your own comfort. You are so concerned with your own belief system. You don't even worry about a great city. We don't know what it means, 120,000 who don't know their left from the right. It could mean there was 120,000 children in that city that were so young they didn't know their left from the right. Or it could mean there was 120,000 people in the city who did not spiritually know the difference between right and and wrong. It doesn't matter, but God was making an example of Jonah, and then the story just ends. It just ends. 
It's a cliffhanger. There's no resolution. There's no solution. There's no Jonah 2 coming soon to a theater near you. We don't know what happens with Jonah. And I thought about this a lot because it bothered me. Why wouldn't God give us a resolution? And here's what I came up with. I don't know if this is right or wrong. This is just where I'm at. Because I believe that the story of Jonah was not just for Jonah, it's for us today. Jonah had to make a choice, and we have to make a choice. Because you know what I believe? I believe that inside each one of us, we have a lot of Jonah inside of us. We have some Jonah blood running through our veins. We have people in our lives that have hurt us. We have people that have hurt our loved ones. We have people who have lied to us, who have taken from us, who have made poor choices over and over again. People who are so different from us, we can't understand why they act that way or what they do. And we have Jonah blood running in us. We say, you know what? I'm just going to distance myself from them. Anybody else like that? Yeah. I've got people that I know. I've got family members that I have who continually make poor choices over and over again. And I feel myself just stepping back. Because we have some Jonah in all of us. But I think the heart of the matter is this question. Is am I okay with God loving those that I don't love. Now you may say, Mike, Michael, who, 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 who are you talking about here? Who are you talking about? You see, I believe that the, that, that the story of Jonah forces us to take a look into the mirror. And we have to look in the mirror and face the fact that there are people who have hurt us. There are people who have hurt those that we love. You know, you hurt me. I, I, I may forgive you, but I will never forget. You hurt someone that I love? All bets are off. Or maybe you lied to me. <laughs> Dad, you said you'd always be there. You'd always be there for me. And you're not. Or your spouse. You stood before God, a minister, and grandma, and said, till death do us part. You lied. You lied. I'm done. I'm done with you. The story of Jonah causes us to take a hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves the question, are we okay with God loving people that we don't love? We have people who have taken from us. Maybe it was a business partner that bailed out. Maybe it was... Uh, they took something from us. They violated our life or our person in some way. And we say, how could you do that? There's no way I could ever love you. Or maybe it's a person in your life that just keeps making poor choices. They come and ask you for money. They come and ask you for advice. And over and over and over again, you just keep doing the same things. You're never going to change. Why would I help you this time? I'm done. You feel that, Jonah? Jonah? running through your body? Boy, I do. But one of the reasons I love the Bible is because there's hope. Do you know who wrote the book of Jonah? Jonah did. It's the most honest and self-incriminating autobiography I have ever read. Do you know if I was Jonah and I wrote the book of Jonah, do you know how it would have gone? It would have gone like this. Hey, God called me to go preach to the Ninevites. i got to be honest with you, I didn't re wasn't really up for that, didn't really like them. Took a few detours, took me a little while to get there, but I got there. You know what? I preached a shorter sermon in the Old Testament, and the whole city turned to God. Boom! <laughs> That's how I would have written the book of Jonah. How did Jonah write it? He talked about it. He was so frustrated, he wanted to die. 
He talked about how he hated the Ninevites so much he ran in the opposite direction. He put the lives of people in danger. He had to spend a night and, and th- three days and three nights in the, in the belly of a fish. And then he finally prayed. And then when he got there, he just mailed it in and God did an incredible thing. But that wasn't even good. He went up to watch the fireworks and nothing happened. And he was still hacked off at God. There's hope. Because I believe that Jonah had to write these words and realize just how far from God he was. Even though he was God's prophet, that he was not okay, that God loved people that he was not okay with. All people matter to God, and they should matter to us, and that's the heart of the matter. When you came in today, you were handed a little small mirror. If you don't have one, we got some back on the soundboard. You can grab one. But I want you guys to take out your mirrors right now that you were given, okay? This is what we call the application part of the sermon, all right? I want you to hold that mirror up, and I want you to look at yourself in the mirror. And I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. Am I okay that God loves people that I don't? Are you okay? Am I okay? Are there people in our life that we don't love But are we okay that God loves them? And the second question is, maybe this one's harder. Who is someone that I'm not okay with God loving? You see, here's what I know. If you're like me, God was bringing at least one or two people or names or situations to your life. People that at one point in time, whether you knew them or didn't know them, they came into your life and they just wrecked a part of your life. And so you just kind of wrote them off. Maybe you screamed at the mirror, maybe you pounded the steering wheel, whatever it was. But you just said, they're dead to me. I'm done. I'm out. God, you deal with them because I'm not. My question is, Are we going to be more like God, or are we going to be more like Jonah? Out in our lobby in a bunch of different places, we've got these little cards that say, pray for one, and maybe for you, you need to write down the name of someone that God is challenging you to love. Now, I'm not going to pretend that one sermon and one little talk is going to help you motivate to, to bridge the gap, but maybe God will start to soften your heart to believe that God loves everyone, and our goal is to be more like Him every day. You see, God loved us when we were unlovely. And the question is, are we going to look in the mirror? How are we going to answer the question? And am I okay that God loves people that I don't love? Let's pray. Father God, this is a hard sermon to preach. Because for me, it's a hard sermon to live. God, I know that Jonah's sin is my sin. God, would you help us? Would you help me to love people because people matter to you, especially those people that have hurt us or lied to us or taken something from us or someone that we love? Would you help us to face the fact that you love everyone, and we should move towards that. God, we confess there's a lot of Jonah's blood running through our veins, but we want to be more like you. So God, my prayer is that we can be more like you, to love those that you love, even the ones that are really hard. In your name we pray. Amen.